1 Corinthians 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as, un, as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you care, envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe, as, un, as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God giveth the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's hus husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Well, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundations can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be, bur shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God de destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him be Become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for, he, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the word or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ's. And Christ is God. You may be seated. Good morning and greetings in Jesus' name. The one we're here to worship this morning. And I trust and it's my prayer that each of you can experience God's grace and peace. Without God's mercy and grace, who are we? We're a lost people without his grace, without his mercy and grace. And it's a blessing to be here this morning as a church and also want to just extend my blessing upon you and even the service so far this morning. It's evident that we need God's mercy and grace. It doesn't matter what, pe matter what people group you're a part of, it doesn't matter where you live in the world, we all need God's mercy and grace. And we're thankful that we have that blessed hope. As Joe mentioned this morning, my topic is on Adam Baptist and Protestant view of Scripture. And I want to take a look at some of the differences between the two views. And as a church or as a constituency, we consider ourselves to be Anabaptists. And so I ask you, what makes you an Anabaptist? Is it because of your heritage and the family you were born into? Does that make you an Anabaptist? Is it because of your faith? What makes you an Anabaptist? 
Our faith, or what we believe, is, has a huge impact on what we do and how we live out our faith. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. There's a few verses here I want us to notice. And thinking about what makes you an Anabaptist? Is it because of your heritage or is it because of your faith? What really makes you an Anabaptist? Do you even want to be one? But notice what 1 John 5, the first five verses says here, how that we overcome the world. In verse 4, if you notice in verse 4, we overcome the world by our faith. So is our faith important? Absolutely. Our faith is extremely important. I want to read these five verses here in 1 John. And take notice a few things here that I will point out after I read these first five verses. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Here we can notice what faith is and what it consists of. In verse 1, it's a faith that believes. It's a faith that believes that Jesus is born of God, or is of God the Father. And then it also, our faith is there, it mentions in verse 2 how that also comes out by our love. Loving God's children. That's part of our faith. The third thing is in verse 3, our obedience. Obedience to God's commandments. That's part of our faith. A faith that believes, a faith that loves, and a faith that live, lives in obedience to God's commandments. And that is the faith that we want to embrace. Because it says here, having that kind of faith, we overcome the world. What you and I believe impacts what we do. A person can say that he believes that Jesus is the Son of God, but we all know that it's really in a person's actions that really prove who that person is and what they believe. Our faith has an impact on us. What we believe will impact what we do. It was about a year ago, I had an interesting conversation with a fellow at work. I was doing some work at his house. And I wasn't there very long and he asked me, he said, what is your faith? And I said, I'm a believer of the Lord Jesus. He said, oh, I'm a man of faith also. And uh, well, we, we got into talking and I soon learned, he, he said he's a pastor. So we soon learned that we had some things in common. And then he, uh, he wanted, to, we were discussing a number of things, but he wanted to go back to this thing. He said, now you're, you said you're a believer. He said, I find that interesting. He said, I'm a man of faith also. And he went on to, to say some of the things he believes in. And he asked me, well, what do you believe? And I, I don't remember all that I said, but we, we got into a, a number of things. But then he wanted to know, I soon gathered what he really wanted to know. He, he was asking, he's, he asked, what is your faith or what is your church? Who is your church? He wanted to know what church I belong to. And then I said, well, I'm a, I'm a Mennonite. Is he familiar with the Mennonites? Oh, yeah, he, he He's familiar with the Mennonites, the Amish and Mennonites. This man lived in Downingtown, so not so far away. And then he said, uh, he asked some things about, really about our faith, but he was still persisting on this thing of, well, what, what kind of Mennonite are you a part of? And I wasn't sure what he's getting at. You know, we're, we're Anabaptists. Um, oh, Anabaptists. And I asked him if he ever heard that term. No, he, he heard the term, but not familiar with who they are. But what church are you part of? And I, I 
was sort of stammering what more he wants. So I said, Beachy. Uh, well, that sort of just opened another can of worms. Well, what's Beachy, right? How do you explain Beachy? Uh, anyway, we, what, we were talking about that for a little bit, but what I found interesting is that it doesn't matter what group of people you are with, um, what you are taught is kind of goes with you. This was an older man. He, he was an assistant pastor this time in his 60s. But as we got to talking about our faith and the different things that we believe and our practices, somehow we got on the thing of baptism and I was explaining to him about the adult baptism. And he sort of stopped me and he said, uh, yeah, he, I was trying to explain to him why we do adult baptism. And then uh, it got his attention to thinking a little bit. It's, it's a person who believes that Jesus is, is the Son of God and makes that profession and lives that out. And it's those kind of people that we baptize. And he said, yeah, I always kind of grimace when I baptize infants. And that sort of caught me, caught my attention. But here was a man that just did something all his life because that's their tradition. And maybe not really thinking about what he is actually doing. And so I say that to say that it doesn't matter where, what part of, what group you're a part of. We all have traditions, right? But are they, the things that we do, are they biblical? Is the challenge I want to give us this morning. Because what we believe has an impact on what we do. And I want to say from the start that my intent is not to make it look like Anabaptists are better people or no more than others. As Anabaptists, we have our weaknesses and have much to learn. And I realize that the term Anabaptist includes a variety of people. It doesn't matter whether you're a Protestant or whether you're an Anabaptist, there is a wide variety within those group of people. Protestants, there's a huge variety of Protestant people within, it's a wide range of denominations. And so it is amongst the Anabaptists. There is differences in how scripture is viewed and interpreted. Joe read there from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it's verse 11 that I want us to remember this morning as I go through this verse. It says there, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I'm not here this morning to lay another foundation. That foundation has been laid, but we are asked to build on that foundation, the Lord Jesus he is to be the center of our focus. He is our rock. He is the one that we are to build on. In Matthew 16, Jesus made that very clear. And he asked his disciples there, if you look at that chapter, he asked them who they think he is. And Peter, we know his response. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then in verse 18, there Jesus responds to that, and he said to Peter, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus said that nothing is going to stop, from, stop the church from continuing to grow. He said, I will build my church. Nothing is going to stop. Nothing is going to get in the way of God building his church. And down through the ages, the true church has faced many difficult and trying times. The early church faced severe persecution. And that persecution has continued over the years, down through the ages, in various areas in the, in the world today. Sometimes the question is asked of why so much emphasis on the Anabaptists? Shouldn't we focus more on the early church, the book of Acts, and focus on that? Why so much emphasis on Anabaptists? And yes, I believe we should focus on the book of Acts. 
and the things that they did there. But I think it's often forgotten or we simply don't realize how things have changed within a few hundred years of the early church. The Anabaptist movement largely became, came about because people saw that the commands of Scripture were not being lived out. They were not being followed. And I believe it's important that we learn from history and don't make the same mistakes that they, they did so soon there after the early church and gradually drifted from what the scriptures taught and commanded. As we all know, and as I often said, that history repeats itself. We see that over and over again. And so I want to just give us a bit of history or background of, of the early church and moving through a, a, the first few centuries and even into up to, 50, up to the Anabaptist movement. And I'm not going to go into detail. I don't have time to go into detail. But to give us a little bit of a picture of the things that happened in a few hundred years, in just a short span of time after the early church. Starting with the crucifixion. We're all familiar with the crucifixion. The death of our Lord and Savior. The resurrection and the day of Pentecost. When God's spirit came upon the apostles and the believers, this was a life-changing experience for those people. And it was a, a radical movement going from the old covenant to the new dispensation. Jesus fulfilled the law. The animal sacrifices were no longer needed. And we can hardly imagine how this admit, must have been for those people. The difference of going from animal sacrifices to saying that Jesus was that sacrifice and that's who we worship. And this totally went against many of the religious leaders and what they believed at that time. And so it wasn't long as, as the gospel was spread and as, as the apostles preached the word, they preached the cross, they preached the resurrection and it wasn't long till there was persecution and that spread rampantly. To the early, to those Christians, to those early disciples, it meant more to them than just being a believer or a worshiper. It meant being a, a spirit-filled person who was obeying Jesus daily in their life. Something that was done daily. And because of their commitment to Jesus and the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives, people noticed that there was something different about them. It was evident. They were transformed. And people wondered why. They marveled at the things that they did, what they stood for, were willing to die for it. And it was very evident that they made Jesus the center of their faith. And for the next 250 years, the first Christians continued to be persecuted and experienced God's spirit in their midst. But then it gradually, over the centuries, it, it began to change. And there was other faith. Yes, there was in the early church too. There was always those, those things of false doctrine. But as time went on, there was more and more of that. Whereas things were questioned, that things were twisted about Christianity. And then we have Constantine come on the scene around the year 300. He became the leader of the Roman Empire. And as a result of a, what he called a spiritual experience in which he saw a vision of the cross, he stopped persecuting the Christians and allowed Christianity to become a recognized religion of the Roman Empire. And it was during his reign and, and even afterward, after his time passing, people came to be judged more by the creed that they held rather than the life that they lived. It was more important to say what they believed than to actually live it out. And think about that. Do, do we see that happening? Living out the creed, things that you believe or say that you believe, but actually not living them out. And so over the next several hundred years, dramatic changes took place and the early Christians 
they were they were persecuted people and worshiping in secret. Now all of a sudden they could meet in public. And they could meet in buildings rather than being secret. For the early disciples, there was for, for the early converts in the, in the early years, there, there was discipleship. They were discipled and taught of what Jesus said and practiced. And they received adult baptism. They were part of a local church. And eventually church and state emerged and it became a requirement to be part of the church. And so it's interesting to, to notice as you look at history, with time, it, it changed from being persecuted to going to church to the church persecuting those who did not go to church. And that's hard for us to grasp. They went from being persecuted to the church persecuting those that didn't go to church. Hard for us to imagine that. There was a shift to infants being baptized and all citizens except Jews belonged to a church aligned with government. The early church had emphasized following Jesus and now it was seen to be more the emphasis on the correct doctrine and following rituals and even defending themselves against enemies. The early converts, the early Christians would have, they were enthused about their faith. They wanted to share it with people. And now in this time and era, it was more evangelism meant primarily extending the boundaries of the Christian empire. And the people were willing to go out and fight for their religion. The Christians went out fighting for their religion. And it became more a focus on an earthly kingdom. It, it became, it eventually came to the point that only Christians were permitted in the Roman army. Only Christians were allowed to be part of the Roman army or to serve in the army. And between the years of 1200 and 1500, a variety of people and groups began to realize that there were serious inadequacies with widely accepted understandings of, the sal of salvation in the church. And we know the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Martin Luther, and you had men like Martin Luther and Eurig Zwingli and, and John Calvin. These men had a huge impact on this. And they came forward and to introduce significant changes and affirm the scriptures as the sole authority for faith and practice. And they insisted that salvation is grace through faith alone. These men had a huge impact on the community around them. And while Christians were expected to respond in faithful service to God and their neighbor, the church's teaching on following Jesus in their daily life was not as important. It was not something that was emphasized then there was a, a number of men that came along in that same time who were not completely satisfied with Luther's teaching and, and uh, Zwingli and John Calvin. And we know those men, a, a few of those men were, were Conrad Grebel and Felix Mons. We had George Blyrock. And these were, were men who, they took what, what Luther and some of those were teaching, but they wanted to go further with it. They said, it's more than just believing it. They said, it's living it out. And they faced severe persecution because of the stand that they took. And we're all from, we're familiar with these stories, but I, I encourage you to look at those stories. The uh, martyr's mirror is full of them because of the stand that they took and believing that it is more than, they, they, they were sure that it was more than just believing. They said, we need to live it out in our daily lives. And it was, they faced severe persecution. Things were terrible, the things, that, the torture, the things that they faced. But I think that as that movement came about, if you would have asked them, 
Or if you would have joined them, they, they were like the early Christians who were putting their eyes on Jesus, their focus on Jesus. I believe their intent was to put Jesus the center of their faith. Now, I only gave you a small picture of what happened in, in a 1500 year time, time span. So what does that mean for us today? The things that took place back then, does that affect us today? Something that happened a thousand years ago, does that affect us today? Absolutely. You think about the Reformation movement, the Anabaptist movement. It, it had and continues to have a major impact on our lives today. And so our faith and our core values and what we believe and how we live that out affects the generations to come. We don't have to look very far in this country to see how things are not emphasized to live it out in our daily lives. And especially the Sermon on the Mount is something that a lot of people would say it's something for the future. Something that we can't hardly live out here in this earth. But it's Jesus' words, and I believe it is for us today. We live in a me world. It's about me and how I want to live my life. And we, we kind of, we see the attitude that everyone is supposed to be okay with what I believe or with what I want to do. I want to look at a few key differences between Protestants and Anabaptists. And I also want to recognize that, that we have gained a lot of knowledge and information from our Protestant friends. They probably have more influence on us than any other Christian group because they believe exactly the same as Anabaptists on issues such as the authority of Scripture. So we feel a certain connection to them and sometimes try to minimize our differences. When we need Bible study resources, we often turn to evangelical books and commentaries. We listen to their teachings via podcasts. We listen to their music. We are, inf we are influenced by these things. And I think if we're not careful, this influence has a tendency to erode the distinctive beliefs of us as Anabaptists even more than the physical persecution did in Reformation days. I want to look at three key differences in comparison to Anabaptists and, and Protestants. The first one is distinct scripture interpretations. How we interpret and view scripture. As Anabaptists, our interpretation of scripture is centered on the teachings of Christ and his call to discipleship. And so then the, then the rest of the scripture is viewed through this, through this lens and interpreted so as not to contradict the teachings of Jesus and him being the head of the church. And this produces different conclusions than when interpretation is centered on the writings of Paul, as often seen in, in Protestant teaching. And so when, when you have a Christ-centered interpretation on Scripture, it teaches that it can be followed with God's enabling grace and in fact needs to be followed if there is entrance into the kingdom of God to be gained. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Denying himself and taking up the cross. A Paul-centered interpretation tends to overemphasize man's sinful nature and makes man somewhat helpless in the pursuit of good. And many of Christ's teachings, especially the Sermon on the Mount, 
are, are often considered something that is unattainable in, in our present world. In fact, some who interpret the Bible this way think of teachings for some future time. And it tends to be more the emphasis is put on God's mercy and forgiveness. And not so much on living out God's commandments and being obedient to his teaching. The second thing about the Anabaptists believe that the New Testament takes precedence over the Old Testament. And maybe you've heard that term of, of the, the flat Bible. Some people would say that we use, some people would say they use a flat Bible where everything is on the same page, putting the Old and New Testament on the same level. And so when political or social issues such as war and capital punishment and those, those with a flat Bible often claim Old Testament texts to support their view of belief. Even when those texts will differ from Jesus' teaching. So that makes a big difference on how you interpret Scripture. Whether you are going to look at the whole thing and not center on Jesus' teaching. The third thing is Anabaptists believe the Bible is best interpreted when the believer is committed to obeying it. The early Anabaptists were, ex were concerned about how the learned and the educated of the day twisted the scripture to get around the force or, or the commandments that Jesus was teaching. Martin Luther did that. He didn't like the book of James, for instance, and he wanted to get rid of that book because he didn't like it, how it says that faith is works, that, the, that works is part of the faith. There are a lot of Protestant people that highly hold such things as baptism and communion, and then other things where we would say that are basically on the same level. It's part of our, our church and the things that, of God's commandments, things like the holy kiss, washing one another's feet, anointing the sick with oil. These are some things that actually, as Anabaptists, that we would view them as being all of God's commands, not just something that we do occasionally. But these are things that we do because Jesus commanded because they are scriptural. Then moving from Bible interpretation, another distinct difference between Anabaptists and Protestants is their view of salvation. Anabaptists believe or emphasize that salvation is by grace through faith that works. And notice that it's a faith plus works. I think we all understand God's atonement that he made for our sins. God declares the sinner righteous because of Christ's work on the cross. And this is in contrast also of just a few key differences of how that we view the scripture and how that God's grace is poured on our lives can make a difference in the things that we do in life. The Protestant view is that justific justification is the result only of an accounting procedure in the books of heaven. Or so saying that just because so if my name is written in the book of life, it doesn't really matter what I do from there. As long as my name is written in the book of life. So that makes a difference of how that you view life when you look at it through those lens. It's the doctrine of unconditional eternal security, once saved, always saved. And this is taught by many Protestant people. And one of the verses that they often use is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Their concept is that when a person says the sinner's prayer and believes that this verse says they will not perish. So you confess 
that, and believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and so you are eternally saved. Some more verses that they use, John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And there are a number of other scriptures that you can use or that they use to support their idea of eternal security. And I'm not going to look at them, but I would encourage you to, to, to take a look at John 3.16, Romans 8, and, and look at the context there of what it is actually saying. It's the, it there it's talking more about God's love for mankind in general. His love for a person doesn't change under any circumstance. God's love is there for all people. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. God still loves you. That doesn't change. You can be the vilest of sinners. God still loves you. We can have eternal security and are promised eternal life but it is conditional. I want, I want you to notice, there's a few other verses I want to read. I want, to note, want you to notice the word if in these few verses. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. 2 Peter 2, 20 and 21. For if... After they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Revelation 2.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. You can look at those verses, and there is a condition to be met in order to have eternal security. I had a man ask me here some time ago. He had asked me this question. He said, can a person lose their faith? Can a person lose their salvation? And this was a man that was visiting at our church, and he was a pastor. And I sensed where he was going with this. Can a person lose their salvation? So I, I didn't give him a direct answer, but I, I referred to some of these scriptures that I had read earlier about, or just these verses about the if part. And then he, then he asked, well, how often does a person need to sin before they lose their salvation? First he asked me, can a person lose their salvation? Then he asked me, how often does a person need to sin before they lose their salvation? Is it once a week? Uh, twice a month? Once a month? Once a year? How often does a person need to sin before he loses their salvation? How would you answer that question? I said, well, I, I know that I'm not the judge. God is the righteous judge. I'm not here to say how often a person needs to sin. But the Bible also does make it clear that we do need to confess our sins. And that's an ongoing thing because we do make mistakes sometimes. But if a person goes on living in willful sin, some of these scriptures that I had referred to allude that there is a time of falling away, that that can take place. Often, with the people that have that eternal security view 
his question, his thought then was, so if a person is living in continued sin, I brought that thing up that if a person continually lives in sin, in willful sin, how can they be saved? His thought was, or the, or the way that they reason that is they would say that that person probably never was saved. That's their view of that. And so as you think about all that, of how that you view that part of it, the Protestant view of salvation often tends to live or lead to careless living in, in many cases. And I believe it can be a dangerous place to be. Because if you think about it, if, if it is my belief that I'm unconditionally, eternally, eternally secured, then my choices will not impact my eternal destination. The things that I do from day to day will not necessarily impact my eternal destination. And so is it any wonder, as you look at nominal Christianity today, you can use the example of divorce. Why is there so much divorce amongst Christian people? It's almost as much among Christian people as the world. But if their view is that it doesn't matter the things that they actually do, that doesn't affect their eternal destination. That makes a difference on the things that you do from your day-to-day -day life. And so most of them see no advantage to living a holy life, a consistent holy life. And I think we realize that we're not totally perfected at conversion. It's something that continues to grow. First John 1.7 says, if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It gives the idea there that it's a continuing cleansing. You need God's, I need God's mercy and grace daily on my life. It's a continued cleansing. It's an ongoing thing throughout life. John apparently believed that a person walking in the light may still stumble at times and need cleansing. And so the things that I wanted us, us to challenge us with is that we don't believe, or we don't come into that category of thinking that we are incapable of sinning after conversion. Or that we can willfully sin and maintain fellowship with God. There's the two different camps there. And, and I want to emphasize those are things that we want, those are the ditches that we want to avoid. One goes too far the one way, one the other way. And I know we're, we're people that we always say, we, we think we're in the middle, right? We, we, we got it right. We're in the middle. We're somewhere in the middle. But God's word never changes. I want to look at the, just the last distinctive belief as Anabaptists. Moving through this one is the two kingdom concept. Jesus said in John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus made it very clear that there are two kingdoms. And along with that is the non-resistance that Jesus taught. As Anabaptists, we believe that our citizenship is in the heavenly kingdom, ruled by Jesus Christ. And it's not in our position or our job to keep order in the kingdoms of this world. We're only, we're only pilgrims here. And we're to invite others into this kingdom, into the heavenly kingdom. Protestants would tend to believe Christians need to help keep order in society. And yet with that, they have never really been able to figure out how to Follow the laws of Jesus' kingdom, which he taught in the Sermon on the Mount, and still keep order in the kingdoms of this world. And so what often can happen, they simply drop the heavenly kingdom values. There was a man who was part of the U.S. Air Force for about 12 years. And this was a church-going man, and as he visited different churches, he noticed that he was very highly esteemed. People recognized when they heard who he was, um, gave him compliments, and he was very highly esteemed. With time and, and uh, conviction, 
he went into full-time ministry and mission work. And he soon noticed, as he went to different churches, that he really wasn't as highly esteemed as he had been before. Sort of a sobering thought. To him, it revealed something. It seemed like the temporal world was more important than the world to come. From the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus taught that there are only two kingdoms on the earth, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And his message was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus prayed for his disciples there in John 17, teaching us that we are not of this world. And as Christians, our fight is spiritual. And we don't fight with the physical weapons of this world. And all through the New Testament, we see Jesus and his disciples demonstrating the the sacrificial love for people of every nation. They lived out these principles, not only with their neighbor, but also in the relationships of community and state and, and the world around them. I just looked at a few key differences between Protestants and Anabaptists, and I realized that you could look at more key differences, but I feel like these are some of the ones that really make a difference of what we do in our daily lives. I ask in the beginning, what makes you an Anabaptist? And so I wonder how you would answer that. It is largely because of our heritage and what we believe. And I like the way Paul Emerson defines Anabaptism in three words. He said this, biblical mandated application. Biblical mandated application. As Anabaptists, that's what we do. We live out what the scripture says, Jesus commands, and we apply them to our lives. We put a lot of emphasis on our heritage. And that has its place, but we want to also be careful with that. God does not accept us or reject us on the basis of our heritage. He accepts us on the basis of our faith in his son, Jesus. In our response to Jesus, We are to live out our lives in in joyful obedience to what he is saying in the scripture. And there's no question that our spiritual forefathers saw obedience and baptism as the only possible results of faith. They said, faith is to obey. They lived out there in 1 John 5, those first few verses. They lived in faith, in love, and in obedience to God's commands. So I want want to encourage us to use our heritage wisely. We have been given much. We've been taught much. And so I believe much is expected. God is looking for men and women, for young people who choose wisely and that are faithful to him. We've been given much, and so we have a huge responsibility to use what God has given us and to live it out daily in our lives. Psalm 61, 5 says, For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. God has given you a heritage. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to embrace that? Are you going to follow the commands of Scripture, or are you going to follow the trend of other people? I want to challenge us to compare ourselves with Scripture and not with other people. We tend to do that in our society today. We look at other groups and we say, they seem to obviously be living a Christian life. Why can't I? I want to challenge us. Compare yourself with the Lord Jesus, the teachings of the Scripture, and don't compare yourself with other people. Compare yourself with Jesus. So may God help us to embrace his word, to live it out, and to be faithful to him.
Kneel with me for prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, for the truth that you've given us. Thank you that we have the privilege to come together today to serve you. We're part of a heritage, God, that you've given us. Give us courage to live out your word. Not only to do the things because others do them, because, but because also of the commandments in your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've given us. And I pray that we would be that temple, that body for you to dwell in. That your, your spirit would be evident in each one here. God, you know each one's heart, motives, their actions. And I pray that we could live lives that would honor you, would glorify you, would even draw others to you. Give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Thank you that you've provided for us so richly for your grace and mercy. I pray your blessing on this congregation. Lord, that they would be a, a light to the community. Give them courage in facing the challenges in life, the struggles. Lord, that they could be overcomers. I pray your, your presence with us as we go from here today. May we honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.